Who cares about privacy? What people care about is power. However, information is power. We take information from the most powerful organizations and we put it in the public record. Sí, me tiraron a la lona, claro que me tiraron a la lona, me patearon, trataron de, de pisarme el, el cuello y estirármelo como un pollo. Otra cosa es que te quedes en la lona, ¿no? Yo no estaré jamás de rodillas. This disclosure is an attack on the international community. We will not allow Mr. Assange safe, safe passage out of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom does not accept the principle. I just want to understand how you can justify the claim that you are treating him like anybody else. Vi ser behandlar honom inte när det gäller det sätt vi arbetar med utredningen. The prosecution of WikiLeaks um, it includes espionage, computer fraud, conspiracy, and theft of U.S. government property. Julian Assange siempre ha estado a disposición de la justicia, siempre en defensa de derechos fundamentales y por eso precisamente se encuentra en la situación en la que actualmente está, por ser editor de un medio de comunicación como Wikileaks y haber puesto en conocimiento de todo el mundo los abusos de poder, los casos de corrupción, el aprovechamiento ilícito de unas estructuras que debiendo estar para proteger a los ciudadanos, los agredieron. Baltasar es un hacker, un hacker distinto. Esos cambios en el sistema es también lo que hace Julia. Q&A part of the uh, evening. Um, I hope you found that film as informative and powerful as I did. Um, I'm joined now by the director of the film, Carl Lupez Rubio, and by uh, Stella Assange. And we hope to be joined by Sam Bacon, who's currently in the middle of a series of votes in the House of Commons, but will be on our way as soon as the whips let her out. Um, so, uh, just to start off the discussion, um, I'd like to first of all ask Clara um, about the making of the film, really. Um, what got you to be uh, so committed uh, to this cause that you put what must have been enormous amounts of work into making the film? So, uh, thank you for being here. It's really amazing to, to see uh, this film being screened in London. So I was making some pictures from there, <laughs> because it's really amazing. Um, yes, we started in 2013, uh, and actually at the beginning we wanted to make um, a film about the lawyer, about Baltasar Garzón. I'm Spanish, and Baltasar Garzón, as you saw in the film, he was a renominated lawyer, and he just had been suspended. Uh, so we wanted to make a film about him. So. We went to his village in, in south of Spain, where my family comes from also, and um, spoke to him and told him we wanted to make a film about, about him. And uh, this that was uh, July 2014, I think, or 13, I don't remember. So uh, and in this time, uh, it just came out, or he just accepted to be the lawyer of, of uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So uh, a lot of press came, and, and then we thought, OK, so maybe that's a sign. So we will start, because we cannot make a film about everything he does, so maybe we will concentrate in this case. So when we started filming, we really didn't know anything about Wikileaks and, and Julian Assange. We really didn't know anything but what we read in the press. Um, but we thought, OK, that's very strange. We are reading these things about Sweden, and then you have Balthasar Garzón and many other human rights lawyers defending him, so this must be something bigger. Um, and then we just started with, with a lot of curiosity. We thought in one year we were going to be finished with the film because we were sure the case would be uh, solved in one year, but yeah, uh, we, yeah, we were like eight years or so making the film after the <laughs> beginning.
actually, Stella, the, the film ends. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing thing to think that the film ended at the point where the magistrate's court had said that Julian shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be extradited. Um, it's astounding how much happens in this case in such a short period of time, as well as how long the case has been going on. So do you want to just say a, a bit about what's been happening since the end of this film? Uh, sure, just to give people a time scale. So Julian lost his freedom on the 7th of December, 2010. And he went into prison for seven days and then house arrest for a year and a half. And then he was in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years, and now he's been in Balmash prison for over three years. This film ends in January 2021. And this is the last time that Julian was able to go to court in person. Because since then, every time he's had a hearing and he's requested to go in person, it's been denied. Um, and Uh, he was arrested on the 11th of April 2019, and he's been in Belmarsh High Security Prison ever since. Belmarsh is um, it's in South East London. It's sort of far away from everything. I find anywhere I am in London, it's about an hour and a half from there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just out in, in more, I don't know. Um, it's really difficult to get to. And, um, so there's been, an, there was an appeal by the US and um, basically what happened was the US lost, as you saw, and there was a political intervention, basically. The US having lost, then um, pulled the political card and issued what it called assurances, which were anything but assurances about um, prison conditions. And outrageously, the High Court uh, ruled that those were sufficient uh, mm -hmm. to change the outcome. And it, it, it's absurd because the, uh, the High Court accepted all the medical evidence. It all stands that if he's placed in extreme isolation, he will be driven to take his own life. Um, it doesn't, the High Court has accepted all that evidence. It's agreed with the magistrate that, um, that the conclusions were uh, sound. But it says um, that it accepts the assurances are, um, address this problem, and they obviously don't. Uh, because the assurances themselves, without getting too technical, um, like the wording of the assurances themselves literally say that the US government um, reserves the right to impose those very same conditions that will kill him. Uh, so it's really scandalous and completely incomprehensible uh, that, that the High Court uh, allowed this to, to go forward. Um, but as I said, basically what it is is a political intervention, a deference to, to, to that political intervention. And now there's an extradition order that has been issued. The matter is before Priti Patel, the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary has the discretion to block this extradition. And there's a lot of pressure from civil society groups and press freedom groups for her to do so. Um, probably the most uh, heavy weight intervention publicly that we know uh, came today from the Human Rights Commissioner of the Council of Europe urging oh, pretty to well. block it. Well done. Uh, well done. Uh, there's, I mean, there's been huge mobilization all over Europe um, in, in many countries um, and 1,800 journalists have written themselves to uh, Priti Patel an open letter saying that this case should be blocked because it affects their safety because of the implications for global press freedom. Um, and you know, the Reporters Without Borders uh, has um, had a 
petition going into the Home Secretary today and in eight different countries going to the British Embassy uh, to, to, to give this petition 65,000 signatures for this petition alone. In Australia, there's a petition 700,000 signatures. One yeah. percent uh, of the entire Australian population has signed that petition. 250,000 of those signatures are from Australians. Uh, and you know, there's there's a lot of pressure for Julia to be extradited, but there's a lot of pressure in the opposite direction as well. Okay, thank you. Um, We'll come to the audience Q&A uh, in just a minute. Just a, a couple more questions though. Uh, Clara, um, one of the reasons why a kind of group has got together to, to try and get the film put on in London, um, and I'd like to say thanks very much to the Curse and Cinema for accepting the booking, because that wasn't straightforward either. Um, but um, uh, Clara, what, one of the reasons we did it is because we'd heard about the reception that the film was getting elsewhere. So could you just give us kind of a picture of of what's happened to the film since it's been released. Yeah, the film was shown in, in, in European televisions, in the German television. Uh, well, it's actually a production of the German television, the Belgium television, and the French-Swiss television. Mm -hmm. So it was broadcasted in public televisions. And then uh, the Italian public television showed it also. Um, and we have been in festivals, and in France it was really amazing. It was in in 80, 80 cities. Uh, it was uh, in the cinemas, so it went very well. And it was, it was uh, presented to the MP uh, people of France in the National <coughs> Assembly, and it was I think it was screened there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and we'll be working to get it put on in more cinemas uh, in, in this in this country. And of course, you can play uh, a, a role in that. You can approach your local cinema. You can talk to them about whether or not they'll put on a showing of it. You can indeed get copies of it and put showings on yourself. So we've done this really as a kind of springboard um, to to a wider distribution of the film. And I guess that brings me to a question uh, to you, Stella. How important do you think uh, it is that um, uh, pieces like this, not just films, but the Anything to Say statue, the kind of cultural interventions in the in the campaign are. It's incredibly important because I mean, this this film is like any filmmaker's dream, right? To have uh, it organically uh, just spread. And um, Julia's, I mean, Julia's case has extraordinary popular appeal, and that's yeah. always been attempted to be suppressed uh, since 2010. Um, what you see now with, with uh, what PayPal has been doing in relation to independent media, uh, consortium news, and the press, for example, uh, yeah. they started 12, 12 years ago. In 2010, when Wikipedia was publishing um, the Iraq and Afghanistan cable, uh, cables, and as soon as uh, the the, sorry, the State Department cables are being published. There was uh, an unprecedented financial block, blockade against WikiLeaks. And that was an attempted censorship because of this incredible popular appeal that WikiLeaks has and had. At the time, uh, the average donation that was coming in uh, was, I think, $15. And WikiLeaks was making something like, um, I think, around this time of publication, 100000 dollars a day in donations. So that got cut off immediately by PayPal when they saw, you know, the the <laughs> the, the popular appeal. And another sign of this came uh, a few a couple of months ago in the crypto world. There was a fundraiser. Um, basically uh, some, anyway, without using the, the crypto jargon. Um, a kind of like a cooperative got together of uh, of investors uh, to raise um, to be able to bid in a charity auction uh, for for Julian. And in six days, ten thousand over ten thousand people got together and raised fifty million dollars. 
choose, okay, are we going to make an interview film, or what kind of film are we going to do? And <coughs> really, at the beginning, we said, okay, we're, we're just going to follow our characters. We just stay there and just be witness of what we are seeing. And, um, and of course, you always have the question, okay, but actually I should go to Sweden and, and interview the women, and I should go to the police station and interview. But we said, no, we stay just with with our protagonists because this is a story that is not being told anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we just stay here and uh, now I'm so happy we did that because we really, after all these years, we just are the public, we, when we see the film, we are just there with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this story would have never been told if we weren't in there just year after year, just with the camera. So Thank you. I think this has a value just to be like a testimony, to, to be there, not more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Look, I, I want to give you guys a chance to ask some questions as well. Um, and I, I mean questions. I've been at this game long enough to know that people in the audience sometimes don't distinguish properly between a speech and a question. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if you'd like to raise your hands, I'll try and, yeah, there, in the register. Uh, there's a mic just there. Uh, hello. Um, I was wondering, uh, so Judge Reza ruled against Julian on, I guess, like the legal points of the case that he ruled for, she ruled for Julian on the grounds of his medical condition. And um, the US was allowed to appeal that uh, before the order went to Pretty Patel. And um, I thought the idea was that the cross appeal would be allowed to proceed if Julian lost on, you know, all of the points ultimately, and then he would be able to appeal on the points that he had originally lost. And it seems like that might still be part of the process after if Pretty Patel signs the order. Um, but why was the U.S. allowed to appeal on the points that they had lost, or on the point that they had lost before the extradition order went to the Home Secretary? But Julian wasn't allowed to appeal on the other points before it goes to the. And I, I think, if I recall, um, in one of the high court hearings, I think one of the judges actually made a comment about that when, um, or, or, or you know, at the preliminary hearings, it might have been uh, where they said we can get to that if he loses the, you know, um, yeah. Okay, let me stop here before that becomes a, a multiple choice question. Um, <laughs> So can you do your best to untangle the legal web? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the rights are, um, all, the, all the points are legal points. Uh, she she uh, rejected nine and accepted uh, the one that is uh, section 91, oppression. Um, the, the high court was given the option to hear both the US appeal and the cross appeal at the same time. And they chose to uh, just hear the the U.S. appeal because the reasoning is, you know, if, if the U.S. loses, then what's the point? Um, he's won, right? Uh, 
So yes, where we are at now is that if Pretty Patel signs the extradition, then we will be given the opportunity to file an appeal, um, to seek to appeal on all the points that were lost. It's basically as if we had lost back in January 2021. That's the position we're in right now. Why does that opportunity come after Pretty Patel? Because the extradition order is not active until she signs it. That's when you appeal. Um, and so now is when all the substantive press freedom, political motivation is prosecution, the political, the fact that this that he's being extradited for a political offense, uh, the abuse uh, involved in the in the U.S. Um, extradition and everything that came before it. Uh, all these points are now um, will be live if uh, Pranit Patel signs the extradition. But at the same time, there's also a possibility to, in parallel, appeal uh, before the High Court Pranit Patel's decision. So it will effectively be joined against the US and the UK. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you. <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. This was very informative film. Uh, you know, very moved by the work that you know you were able to do. Uh, you know, this is really what is needed. You know, because people want to know the facts. And they want to know the truth. So, but there's just one thing I wanted to ask. Do you know about the? Um, it's a very, very important quote that John Kilger put out in a speech in Australia, and it it is about a document, a secret document, which was revealed from 2008, okay, March 2008, where it, you know it. He quotes what this secret American Defense Committee set out about Julian that he must be discredited in every way, you know, in every way. Mm. So, you know, I feel this is a very <coughs> important thing that should be put out to the public, you know, because, you know, my friend, Arvind and Balakrishnan, they did succeed in charging him with what they couldn't do to Julian, charging okay. him with sexual well, offenses. We'll go to question, just give us so, some time to take some Yeah, I just want to say that... Other questions as well. So, anybody else like to put their hand so, up? Yeah, so this... this you, can I just, just finish? Here. No, no, you've actually got Where's the freedom of well, speech? I would like to Come on. Hear this question. So we're we're talk talking about, talk about freedom of speech. Of speech. Yeah. 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 But I just have two words to say and you won't let me say. Come on. <laughs> One thing I'm wondering is if we couldn't, um, you know, a lot of this is a PR problem. We can't believe the mainstream media. We're, that's kind of our biggest battle. It seems like a lot of this is more of politics that I don't quite understand, but it, it, it seems like if we could shift the, the whole message. And I don't see a lot of young people here. Is there a way we can get star power? <laughs> can we get, can we get uh, you know, the old rock concert going to get people behind us? And, because I think that what you're doing is very powerful with this film, and it started me thinking, can we do this in a bigger way and get yeah. kind of push sway the whole? Well, it's funny you should ask exactly that question, but there are a number of us considering <coughs> exactly that um, possibility at the moment. Uh, there's a questioner just at the back there, I think. Thank you very much. <coughs> I watched the movie, it says Hacking Justice. But I'm observing the movement and the people who are involved in the Julian Assange's case. Don't get me wrong, we're all hacked as well. The words depressing and pessimism is more around the people than optimism and being positive. And the reason for that is we are hacked spiritually and mentally yes. 
by the mainstream media, yeah. by Pentagon and the wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. And people forgot that why Julian Assange has been persecuted in the first place. Mm -hmm. It is because the war owners and the criminals, they have committed crimes, and yeah. we do not talk about those crimes of genocide in Afghanistan, yeah. mm -hmm. Iraq, and Libya. And okay, the let, me just is that, let me just put that question. It's a good question. Uh, and there's uh, some. Let me just finish. Yeah. Let me just. <laughs> yeah. But just only one second. Yeah. Let okay. Go ahead. Yeah. It, it needs to be quick <laughs> because. Um, Why not me? I'm coming from Come a victim's on. family. Let me give you my perspective because you might not have heard the perspective of the victim. So this is how this whole campaign is like a one-wing bird. It's turning round. The other wing is missing. And I'm here to give you the other wing. <laughs> Yeah, the the other wing is. Uh, I'm going to ask her uh, to come back on that because sure, Paul sure. Julian was very involved in the whole business of exposing war crimes. Okay. So, can you just go? Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about that aspect? Of the just let me finish before <laughs> she answers. The, the, my question to Stella is can we focus the next wing, I say, on the trial of the ICC, International Criminal Court, to bring those criminals responsible for the genocide of, of people in Afghanistan and give... Tell Julian Assange, make more smiles, be happy, keep the spirit high, we're gonna win, we're gonna bring the war criminals to justice. He will be free. Um, well, thank you. Uh, there's uh, there is an important um, aspect to, to this, which uh, I find sometimes um, frustrating, which is uh, that sometimes Julian's case gets caught up in as a symbol for points that people want to make about other things. And I mean that there's very important and valid criticism, for example, about the mainstream media. Failed stream media. But in order to get Julian free, um, Making it all about that won't get us Julian's freedom. And there has to be a constant check on whether, on what can be done <coughs> to achieve Julian's freedom. Yeah. Uh, and all these other issues are, are very important and valid issues but as far as the movement to free julian they're just one objective um and that's why i try to be a little bit uh i try to engage as much as i can and give the the critics and the skeptics a way out uh, and invite them to uh, support Julian. I, I reject the suggestion that there are, you know, Julian Assange supporters and the rest. I think the majority of people actually support Julian. Yeah. Um, and then there are some fanatics that are never going to support him and want him in prison. There are some people who are undecided because they don't know. Um, but given given the you know the bare the obvious uh, you know people people tend to all agree on the fundamentals of, of an open and free democratic society and they might have different ways of getting there and uh, you know different politics around that but Julian is not about left right um, 
and his what is being done to him is cruel and inhumane and I think that the focus on that is what um, what gets you know what has a, a lot of power of bringing um, people onto the same to open their mind up to, to hear the story and to understand what's really going on and get rid of all the you know all the the, the mud and the and the uh, kind of politics uh, that people want to make in a way you know sometimes I feel like Julian Julian becomes a yeah he becomes a, a, a symbol for for other fights yes and it's it's really difficult you know, many fight, many of those fights are completely valid and, and important, but Julian needs to be free. Thanks very much. <laughs> now, I'm really pleased uh, that Dr. Begum MP has uh, managed to free herself from the uh, onerous <laughs> task of voting in Parliament and uh, going to see you. Um, I'm just going to uh, continue my conversation here and then I'll come to you and we can have a bit of a chat about the, the case as well, give you a chance to settle down. But I, I just don't want to miss the chance um, of um, continuing the point that Stella was making about the mainstream media with, with, with you, Clara, because um, you know, I think we all understand the, the biases that exist in the mainstream media, but it's one thing to recognise the bias, it's another thing to think that, that is 100% and that you could never get a good story, or there's never a good journalist, or there's never going to be a moment where you can't influence some of the press to do the right thing. And I think we have to separate those two things in our minds. I think it's interesting what you said about the film itself being shown on the public service broadcast in two European countries. Now, if the, if the mainstream media were as monolithic as some people seem to think it is, that should never have happened. But it did. So do you want to just tell us a bit about that? Because that's an interesting thing. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredible that it was like that. <coughs> they have had this person in, in the German television who, who, who stand from the beginning for the film. And, um, and yeah, it, it was like that. So it was screened in, in the German television several times. And it was uh, online one year uh, for free in the Mediatek. And, uh, well, yeah, so uh, I, I just want to do some, uh, to say something yeah. about uh, just to to just 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 to, to think together with you because the, it's re really revolution revolutionary what uh, Wikileaks and, 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 and Julian thought about journalism is that you don't have when you are a journalist you don't write opinions yeah. you just show the documents you just show them as they are and it's really revolutionary because. Much more and more and more and more. There are like op like like there are official official stories that are told uh, through the through the media, and this is really revolutionary. That you you just want to know about something about Ukrainian war or about Syrian war or about another issue, and you just look at the documents. So uh, this uh, makes possible to make a journalist of all of you. Yeah. Uh, without yeah. having to, to okay. read like a, a, a summary with an opinion about something. Of course, it's, it's easy, you know, because we don't have time to, to, to research about everything that happens in the world. But uh, it's something great about this idea. And it's crazy that this idea is being punished, because it's something very simple, just yes, to show the documents. That's yeah. all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, that's fun, um, I want to give you a chance to say something, really, because uh, there's a kind of special moment in the campaign at the moment where um, the case isn't before the court at the moment. And all the time um, that it has been before the court, I know that parliamentarians, as well as the rest of us, are always told, oh, you can't ask questions in Parliament, you can't say this because the case is sub -judicial. Um, but it's not subjudicial now. So there's a kind of special moment, isn't there, for parliamentarians to be able to challenge the critical tell and to raise the question of the extradition treaty. Absolutely. And firstly, I just want to say um, congratulations to Clara for, for making this film, because I think bringing out the story 
as it should be understood and heard, is, is so important. And just incredible courage and determination from Stella as well. I think particularly last week, I've not been able to come to every single demonstration, but it's just hasn't she been just amazing? The courage and determination. I think it's astounding, and it's just so inspiring as well. Um, and then just on your point, I mean, I think absolutely, I think throughout um, the campaign and as it has been developing, um, quite rightly so, people have been asking, well, what are politicians doing? What are people in power doing? And in some ways, we have had our hands tied by archaic, and I feel archaic uh, parliamentary restrictions and processes and procedures. Um, but of course, you know, when a case is going through the courts, um, we, you know, generally speaking, in, in, in the public domain, we, we have to be very careful about what we say to, to allow for um, the case to be heard in, in the courts. And so we, there were particular moments where we really wanted, a few of us in Parliament really wanted to uh, table motions, put pressure on the government, because we knew from very, very early on, you know, when this case first began, that this is a political attack, this is a political case. And um, therefore, it needed a political backpack and it needed a response accordingly. Um, and when we tried to engage with the parliamentary structures, and, and just a little bit before then, I mean, I think it's, you know, there were many, many attempts for MPs to try um, and meet Julian in prison, um, and that was rejected on, on many occasions. I think today, I think it's just one member of parliament, John McDonnell, that was eventually, after many attempts, allowed to visit him in prison. Um, and that was it. And I think when we went into the lockdown, there was absolutely, of course, no access even pretty much to family. Um, and then we made another attempt to uh, reach out to the governor of the prison directly to actually meet Julian and say, we're a group of MPs, we want to hear from him directly. And that was uh, refused as well. Um, but um, a few of us um, from the socialist campaign group of MPs did go outside of the prison just to try and deliver the letter again to the governor just to apply that little bit more pressure as well. But in terms of, as you say, the parliamentary processes, it has been quite restricted. You know, we, we, there were times we were trying to sort of lay down motions, but because it was being taken through the courts, we were told that you know it, it can't be tabled. Um, so now there's a small window of opportunity where we have uh, been able to um, put down a motion that's been led by Richard Bergen MP for uh, Leeds East. Um, and that has got some support. You know, It's not a huge number, but it's definitely going to be something that is looked at and certainly civil servants and you know people in the government will be looking at that motion and know that there is a level of pressure that is continuing on this case um and you know it goes back to what what, what i said i mean now with the way in which and, and you know it's down to people like john and, and the campaign um that has you know continued to develop i think the campaign's come a really long way forward you know in the early stages people were still talking about the swedish case and you couldn't get away from the stigma associated with that at so many levels, you know, whether that was approaching politicians, whether it was approaching different campaign groups, trying to bring different parts of grassroots movements together, people are always talking about, oh, I can't, you know, can't associate myself with that, or there's question marks over there. And, you know, what has happened since is a growing campaign, a developing campaign, which has, you know, really talked about the issue at hand. And, and this case very much has become about human rights. We're talking about a human being has been put in the highest maximum security prison, um, on you know on remand prisoner, with no real charges placed against them in the UK jurisdiction. And I think that is really shocking. We have to yeah. come back to that fact. And now the decision lays um, with with uh, the Home Secretary. So it's going to be very much a political decision. So it's a political case. It always has been. Um, and now all the political pressure needs to be continued to be put on. The Home Secretary to, to make the right decision. Yeah. I, know, I know some of the um, are trying to support are, are planning a, um, an action coming up in June. I'm going to come to Jeannie in the audience in yes. a moment or two just to say something uh, about that. But uh, but Stella, before I do that, um, looking forward now in terms of campaigning, I'll end the evening um, with an idea about what ordinary people can do about the Asylum case. What are the most important milestones coming up, do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, um, I always, uh, I don't like being too dependent on the, on the legal calendar because those are dates that we can't anticipate, they're going to change, and it basically, 
those those dates become important anyway. Um, but just organizing um, around campaigning should be done kind of on our on our own um, dates and our own terms. I find Julian's fifty first birthday will be on the third of July. Um, it will be his fourth birthday in Belmarsh Prison. Um, the uh, you know dates like uh, World Press Freedom Day was a, a very good day to, to kind of hook Julian's case to uh, the broader issues. Uh, I find that they um, there's a danger partly because the case is, has been complex and it's been all, you know it's over a decade um, of <laughs> Of developments, uh, people tend to think of it as some kind of sui generis thing, uh, but actually Julian's case is anything but that. Uh, the implications are are enormous in many different directions. Yeah. Press freedom being one, uh, but you know even even if you look at just the court case and the implications of um, the political fa offense, for example, that the, the UK courts are seen um, prepared to allow people to be ex extradited for political offenses. Um, that's that's the position at the moment. Uh, and and if uh, the courts find in favor of extradition on the appeal, that will be a binding law. Um, you know that the the implications for. Uh, Refugees and uh, people living in exile in the UK are, are huge. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it it's it opens up uh, the UK and, and other countries to to other governments doing the same um, to applying the same logic as the US is in this case uh, to persecute their critics abroad. They're uh, critical journalists or people who are or just critical journalists in in um, foreign jurisdictions. It's completely insane. Um, so sorry, going back to the campaigning. Um, yes, uh, don't extradite Assange. Dot com uh, has uh, a, a, a mailing list. Please sign up to that. It keeps everyone up to date. It also has a very handy, if you're writing to people, handy tab uh, of statements where it compiles statements, for example, from the Council of Europe, from the UN, from Human Rights Watch, and Reporters Without Borders, and all the subject experts. You don't have to know the details of this case because I don't expect any, <laughs> any person who hasn't been living it for the last 10 years to, to know all the details, but, um, but there are subject experts who have analyzed the case in detail and have all the arguments and the analysis all laid out, and uh, the way to appeal to politicians um, and to, for example, journalists that should be saying something and haven't yet, uh, is to appeal to authority, as in authority from these subject experts, United Nations, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, and so on, who are all, um, you know, very, very clear, Amnesty International, that this case has to be dropped and Julian has to be freed. Um, follow me on Twitter. You know, just just uh, stay informed and talk to people. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Talk to your networks. Whenever you can. And there's a lot of uh, information on that website. There's also a show reel of like. Um, documentaries and clips of Julian speaking. It's so important for people you saw him in the film to hear Julian's own voice because there's been such an attempt to mediate and to stop his voice from coming out. He's been completely silenced. He's been silenced from a year before he got arrested. Ecuador gagged him and said he couldn't make any public statements because if he did, he would be expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy. This was uh, March, I believe, 2018. That's when he was last heard. And since then, there's been a progressive effort to bury him and to make him, to kill him from public 
consciousness. So please just find these clips, listen to him. Listen, you can just tell what kind of person he is by hearing him speak. He's thoughtful, he's caring, he's analytical, he's brilliant. Uh, and and they're you know they're trying to kill him. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so I know um, when we've spoken to uh, other filmmakers, um, they usually hate this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, um, because they're usually exhausted when they've finished a project like this. Um, do you think there's a sequel to be made? Uh, will it be by you, or is it the task of another filmmaker? I think it's the task of another <laughs> filmmaker. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are film, films coming so in the next month, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeannie, go on. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I want to pick up on uh, what Stella was saying about campaigning, and then I want to, uh, in a wider way, bring it back into this room. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for, for being here. Uh, um, the DEA does an amazing job, and um, there's also the committee for uh, the defense of Julian Assange, which is um, specifically London-based. And we organize, uh, in fact, we organize a vigil every Saturday at Belmarsh. So many of us are familiar with that journey that Stella described earlier. Um, it is a hard place to get to, and it does take an hour and a half. Um, so if any of you want to join us, um, from time to time. Please do, it's from 12 until 2. Um, and um, we also have a vigil at Piccadilly. And particularly in this next eight weeks, we are going to um, gather outside um, the Houses of Parliament. Yes. On Wednesdays. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Yeah. On one to three. Eight, from the eighth of June to the twentieth of July, from twelve to uh, two, no, uh, to try 20. and meet the um, uh, MPs who are coming out. Uh, we might, in fact, have a conversation with Apsana if she's coming out. Give some tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in order to ask them what they are doing and make some suggestions about what they might do in this window of opportunity. Um, that, so those are the, uh, the, the immediate um, things that the campaign to defend Julian Assange is doing. We are also, uh, in conjunction with the DEA, going to try and roll out this uh, film to other cinemas. And it, indeed, as John said, and in fact, there is a, a, a cinema programmer and owner here in the audience who has come and may well, I hope, screen it um, at her cinema. So please do go to your local uh, cinemas and ask them if they might uh, screen it. Um, there is a newsletter for the JADC, the, com the Committee to, to Defend Julian Assange, so if you go on Google, you can find it, and there are also um, there notifications of events, and um, there's also a link to provide information for local cinemas uh, that you might have a contact with. My, finally, just very quickly, I want to bring it back into the room mm -hmm. and um, invite you to buy this book this evening. It's written by Nils Meltzer, who 
uh, is briefly uh, seen in the um, in the film. It's called The Trial of Julian Assange, and it does what the film does. It gives you the facts about the case from from 2019, but earlier as well, and from someone who is a lawyer, an international uh, professor of international law, who himself was not particularly supportive, um, had kind of believed the uh, propaganda effort to destroy Julian Assange's reputation. But because he's an honorable man and professional, did go and interview him, and from then became a staunch um, defender. And the book chronicles that. Um, and also, uh, it talks about the women. Uh, and it talks about the women and uh, Julian from a legal perspective um, in a way that makes it clear that no one was well served by that process. And finally, neither are we. Mm. So it's 10 pounds, it's a discounted price. There are two spots where you can buy it when you go out. If you haven't can't buy it tonight, get your library to order it. Go into your local bookshop, get them to order it. If you teach journalism, if you teach media, put it on your course, on your, on your students' reading lists, have a seminar on it, invite one of us to come and speak. Um, so that's it, the trial of Julian Assange. And uh, good luck okay. everyone. Okay, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask, I just to close up the discussion. Uh, I'll see how will be around and I can see many more uh, of you want to ask questions. You can, uh, by all means, have a chat with them afterwards. But Sam, I just wanted to ask you this, because um, obviously, there's a number of people who are campaigning, a number of people we hope will be campaigning, and often campaigners say, well, do MPs listen? Uh, and you know, on the DEA website, we've got a, a thing you can automatically you know, email your MP. Um, yeah. I remember many years ago, during the Iraq war demonstrations, um, Claire Short, who was in the cabinet then, uh, said to me, don't worry whether you're having an effect. She said, the Metropolitan Police, whatever they say about the numbers of the demonstrations in the press, they give the MPs and they give the cabinet the correct figures. Um, what do you think about it? What, when you were sat there, does it make a difference when people campaign? Uh, I think just on that point, I didn't know that actually. Maybe, maybe the cabinet do get those figures <laughs> because um, I think what we've seen in the last few years with um, the Black Lives Matter protests, the climate change um, protests, I mean, we've had you know, actual bills directly be presented in response to those protests, right? So, you know, the, the clampdown that we're seeing from this government is as a result of the, 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 the fear and the, the, the threat that they feel from people rising up and people sort of demanding their rights. Um, yeah. but, but I think it does make a difference. It sounds a bit cliche maybe to say, but when MPs do start getting emails, I don't know, say more than 100 or sub 200 on a subject, they're like, okay, that one probably needs responded to, to my constituents. And if they keep having people chase them up, you know, on a particular subject matter, it is going to be brought to the MPs' attention, even if they're not looking at every single email, their stuff would be like, oh, this one's here, yeah, this, this one keeps coming back. So I'd never underestimate that. I mean, sometimes even those uh, automated campaign um, campaigns, the ones that DA have run, do send those ones out to your MPs because they, they should get somebody in their office say, right, we have got 200, maybe we need to send a response out, maybe we need to engage on this on this issue. And the more that happens, the, the greater that they know there is a strength of feeling in their constituencies um, on this issue. And I think, um, I think on, uh, at various different times, certainly in my two years so far in Parliament, I've, I've seen, you know, presence outside Parliament having an impact on, you know, the way MPs are voting, you know, the, the, the strength in number, the loud noises, and also, like, the, the persistent nature of some campaigns. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that plan that Jeannie just said about, you know, those particular days and those particular times standing outside and, and demanding, you know, can sometimes actually be quite powerful in, in such a big, fast space like Parliament. Okay. Thank well, you. they are, uh, we knew it, but you had it confirmed by an MP. What you do makes a difference. Do it better, do it longer, do it more consistently, and we'll make more difference. Thanks very much for coming.
Who cares about privacy? What people care about is power. However, information is power. We take information from the most powerful organizations and we put it in the public record. Sí, me tiraron a la lona, claro que me tiraron a la lona, me patearon, trataron de, de pisarme el, el cuello y estirármelo como un pollo. Otra cosa es que te quedes en la lona, ¿no? Yo no estaré jamás de rodillas. This disclosure is an attack on the international community. We will not allow Mr. Assange's safe passage out of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom does not accept the principle. I just want to understand how you can justify the claim that you are treating him like anybody else. Vi ser behandlar honom inte när det gäller det sätt vi arbetar med utredningen. The prosecution of WikiLeaks um, it includes espionage, computer fraud, conspiracy, and theft of U.S. government property. Julian Assange siempre ha estado a disposición de la justicia, siempre en defensa de derechos fundamentales y por eso precisamente se encuentra en la situación en la que actualmente está, por ser editor de un medio de comunicación como Wikileaks y haber puesto en conocimiento de todo el mundo los abusos de poder, los casos de corrupción, el aprovechamiento ilícito de unas estructuras que debiendo estar para proteger a los ciudadanos, los agredieron. Baltasar es un hacker, un hacker distinto. Esos cambios en el sistema es también lo que hace Julia. 